Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, and welcome to lecture four of Dynamic Atomic Force Microscopy Methods. Um, in the last class, we were talking about um, the steady state uh, response of cantilever probes to uh, different kinds of excitation. We talked about two kinds of excitation. We talked about uh, dither PSO excitation methods where the base of the cantilever is excited. And we've talked about uh, all the other methods where forcing is applied directly to the cantilever. Uh, what we started with last time was the point mass model, uh, which included uh, effects from the excitation. So, for example, in the case of a magnetic excitation, we had a FEXT, which would be the external force acting on the uh, point mass model. In the case of dithopius excitation, we would have a Z base, which is the base motion of the cantilever. Uh, we also discussed the fact that uh, when one writes out the transfer functions, uh, for these two situations, one is not just looking at the absolute amplitude uh, as a function of excitation frequency or phase lag uh, of response as a function of excitation frequency, but rather one needs to be careful about what is it that one observes uh, in, in the particular AFM. Uh, specifically in the case of a dither piezo uh, setup, we have really emphasized the fact that one doesn't really observe the absolute uh, tip displacement Q sub T or QT, but one actually uh, observes the relative displacement of the tip relative to the base of the cantilever, which changes the form of the transfer function completely. Um, so, for example, what I've shown up here from last time uh, on the top row are the uh, amplitude of the oscillator as a function of drive frequency and phase of the oscillator as a function of uh, drive frequency, actually the phase lag, for a magnetically excited case where you see this classical, you know, amplitude increases when you hit resonance and then dips. Uh, on the other hand, for the dither piezo setup, uh, it looks very different in that the amplitude, measured amplitude, is very small uh, at low frequencies, increases to a max value and then goes down. And last time we talked about many different uh, important differences between these two cases. Um, but what we'll focus on today is uh, when we deal with directly excited cantilevers or with dithopius excited cantilevers, we have uh, basically made the case that there is a correct point mass oscillator model for each of these situations that correctly captures uh, the motion of the probe tip. And remember, we need to know the motion of the probe tip because it's through the motion of the probe tip that we really measure the interaction forces between the tip and the sample. And uh, on the left, for example, is the point mass oscillator model, model for directly excited cantilevers, where all the quantities in red are effective quantities that we need to determine. Uh, on the right is an example of uh, a dither piezo excited cantilever, uh, where again the Z base is not the real base motion of the cantilever, but is an effective value based on an ener energy principle uh, that allows us to ensure that this model will give us exactly the same uh, tip motion as the real probe. Now, we can get at these effective values uh, through fundamental the theoretical models of these beams with taking into account all these uh, euler bernoulli theories, uh, take the actual shapes into account, uh, we can worry about the magnetic forces and model all of them, but uh, as experimentalists, we're also interested in determining these quantities in a self-consistent way through simple experiments. And uh, this is what is very commonly done in practice. And so today, we're going to go over the key methods that are out there to determine these effective quantities uh, that are required for an accurate, high-fidelity point mass mo oscillator model with excitation uh, for the AFM probe. We're going to begin with K, the effective spring constant, and then we'll describe how the rest of the quantities can be worked out. Now, what is K? Uh, you may recall in part one, we've talked about a quantity called K sub C. K sub C uh, refers to uh, the ratio of, uh, you know, the force you apply to a static force you might apply at the end of the cantilever beam to the measured deflection Q. The ratio of the two is basically K sub C. For the case of uh, rectangular cantilevers, using the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, it is possible to derive an analytical expression in terms of the material properties and the geometric properties of the rectangular beam. 
uh, specifically the Young's modulus E and the uh, area moment, uh, which is I, and L sub C, which is the length of the cantilever. The area moment depends, again, on the width and thickness of the cantilever, as shown. The problem is uh, the thickness of the cantilever isn't very well known in most situations because of the fabrication process used to produce uh, these cantilevers. And uh, the second thing is this formula is really valid just for nice and rectangular cantilevers. On the other hand, if you look at the cantilever shown on the top right, uh, you see a cantilever that about for two-thirds of the way is pretty rectangular, but the last one-third it becomes like a picket. And in that case, you know, these kind of formulas become error-prone. So it is kind of important to be able to measure K sub C uh, or K um, in an accurate fashion in a self-consistent manner uh, through experiments. Now, the simplest experiment one might be able to think of is to apply a known force and measure the deflection, and that way one knows the uh, spring constant of the cantilever. However, at the nanoscale, there are very few standards or methods by which one can apply a known, for example, one nanonewton force. It's very hard to do. So we need other ways to do it. Uh, the other important fact that one needs to highlight is that there is a difference between K sub C, which is the spring constant, the static spring constant of the cantilever, and uh, the effective uh, spring constant K uh, for the point mass oscillator. And the, the reason for the difference is subtle and is as follows. Recall that the correct value of the effective spring constant K uh, needs to be prescribed based on an energy equivalence, which states that for a given tip motion, uh, the strain energy stored in the actual probe due to bending of the beam. As the beam bends, it's got curvature, and the fibers on the top and the bottom of the beam are getting stretched and compressed. Uh, that strain energy, or potential energy, should be equal to one-half uh, kq squared, where q is the deflection uh, at the tip of the cantilever. Now, when you apply a point force, a static point force to the cantilever, um, you had derived using bernoulli euler beam theory in part one of the class that the deflection curve uh, is as shown, uh, given by a combination of a cubic and a quadratic uh, dependence on x, which is the uh, uh, coordinate measuring uh, the length along the cantilever. So when you have this kind of deflection profile, you end up getting a certain kind of curvature profile. And when you have a certain kind of curvature profile, you get a certain profile of uh, uh, strains in the cantilever, and which leads to a certain potential energy expression. On the other hand, uh, when you actually resonate a cantilever at one of its resonance, the shape that it takes uh, is actually uh, not given by the same simple quadratic and uh, cubic expression. In fact, the shape is given by a combination of sines and cosines and sine hyperbolics and cosine hyperbolics, and uh, even for a simple rectangular beam. and uh, uh, these, of course, are things that are uh, dealt with in advanced classes and in vibrations and so on, uh, but we won't go into too much detail there. But suffice it to say here that clearly the shape of the displacement profile when you drive something at resonance is going to be different uh, than when you simply apply a static force. As a result, the stored potential energy is going to be different, and if the stored potential energy is going to be different, the effective uh, spring constant will also be different. Having said that, uh, you know, in general, the static spring constant and the uh, uh, dynamic or the effective spring constant for dynamic AFM are not uh, too different when you deal with the lowest frequency mode of the cantilever. When one goes to uh, higher order modes, these differences become quite a lot. Uh, but uh, for the first fundamental mode, uh, the difference between the displacement profiles uh, shown here between the two cases is not too different. Now, we do need to know the exact spring constant K sub C or the effective uh, spring constant K for many reasons. Anytime you want to measure forces or energy dissipation or, um, uh, or uh, uh, hysteresis loops quantitatively, anytime one wants to do that, one needs to know what the spring constant of the cantilever is or the effective sp stiffness of the cantilever is. So without it, it's going to be impossible to do uh, quantitative atomic force microscopy. Now, uh, I do recommend to you, there's a couple of very nice review articles that go through uh, many different methods that are out there 
to try and get at these quantities using experimental data. What, what I wish to do today is to highlight two uh, basic methods that one could use to determine the effective uh, stiffness K or the effective spring constant K in our point mass model of the AFM cantilever probe. Uh, the first method is known as the Cleveland method, and basically what it consists of is um, applying or adding a mass M sub add at the end of the cantilever and measuring the shift in resonance frequency. So if omega naught is the original resonance frequency where K and M are the effective spring constant and the effective mass of your uh, AFM uh, probe, and if omega naught prime is the altered one due to the addition of a mass at the end of the cantilever, uh, then you can take these two expressions and eliminate uh, the effective mass M of the cantilever from the two equations, and you get an expression for the effective spring constant K of the cantilever uh, in terms of the added mass and the shift in frequency. So this is a pretty accurate method, but you do need to uh, find an accurate mass and position it, so it may not be the most convenient way of uh, calibrating your cantilevers. Uh, the second class of methods, which is actually very commonly available in new commercial AFM systems these days, are based on the thermal methods. Uh, the thermal methods uh, were originally proposed, uh, uh, you know, in Hutter and Beckhofer's work, and there's a nice review um, uh, in, in this other article by Button Jashke uh, of this method. But the key uh, essence of this method is based on something called the equipartition of energy. So I'll go to the board now and quickly uh, highlight how this works. So recall that Q sub T is the time varying displacement at the, uh, at the end of the cantilever. If I take a square of it and put these pointy brackets, then these pointy brackets actually refer to the mean value of whatever's inside them. So what I've written out here is the mean squared displacement of the cantilever. Um, this can be defined as the limit of uh, t going to infinity of one over t the integral from zero to t of q squared t dt. Now, the equipartition of energy theorem basically states that the total or the average potential energy stored in a simple harmonic oscillator must equal uh, a quantity dictated by a fundamental uh, constant. Specifically, we know that the uh, average potential energy in the oscillator, in the simple harmonic oscillator, or in the point mass model, must be given by the average value of one half kq squared. Uh, k is, of course, a fixed number, so the average value simply applies to q squared, or the mean uh, displacement squared. Uh, this must equal, according to the equipartition of energy uh, theorem, equal one half Boltzmann constant times the absolute temperature T. So the idea of using this simple principle from statistical physics is to uh, use the universal constant Kb, uh, measure the absolute temperature in Kelvin, where your experiment is being performed, measure uh, using uh, the laser photodiode, um, measure the mean square displacement, and then use this relationship to determine what the effect of spring constant K is going to be. Now, keep in mind that when one deals with thermal methods, what one is talking about is the fact that the cantilever is not driven uh, with base motion, it's not driven with magnetic forces, rather, it's just sitting in a thermal bath consisting of all the random Brownian motion of uh, air molecules or water molecules around it, and so it's in thermal equilibrium with all this uh, statistical fluctuation going on around it. Uh, one can also apply the equipartition of energy theorem to figure out the effective mass by equating the average kinetic energy, one-half m times the average value of q dot squared to one-half kBT. So one can also do that. But the key thing is, in order to use this formula, one has to measure in your experiment um, what is the value of the average uh, squared displacement. Uh, 
And one does that by going through a two-step process. The first step, one would measure the time-varying fluctuations out of the photodiode and do what's called an autocorrelation function, which I've shown here, R sub QQ, which basically is a measure of how similar uh, the signal is at time t currently to the time uh, tau seconds ago. The main thing is the units are going to be in meters squared because we're measuring uh, displacement Q of t, which is in meters or in nanometers. And then one goes through a second step and does a Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function and comes up with the power spectral density S sub QQ, uh, whose units by inspection are going to be meter squared per hertz. So the power spectral density is so-called because it measures the density of the power in the signal. Power refers to Q squared, uh, the dis displacement squared. And so really what it represents is a way, is a way to tell us uh, how much power is, or how much Q squared is, uh, uh, is, is located in which part of the energy uh, or which part of the frequency of the oscillator. Remember, uh, we've got a cantilever sitting in, in the middle of a bath where molecules are undergoing random motion. So there's going to be all kinds of frequencies in the mix. But not surprisingly, the cantilever is going to oscillate the most. Most of the power is going to be contained within a frequency that surrounds the resonance frequency of the simple harmonic oscillator. So what I've shown here on the next slide is a simple example of a power spectral density of uh, a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, by the way, these, these going through the autocorrelation power spectral density, uh, these are standard routines in signal processing that are actually built into many new AFM systems. Uh, if not, you can always get a, uh, if, you, if you have access to the real-time signal coming out of the photodiode, you could actually extract that, record that, and do a MATLAB code to actually write, uh, do the autocorrelation and the power spectrum. But this would be a typical uh, power spectral density plot. And if one looks at the area underneath uh, uh, the curve located between two frequencies, F1 and F2, uh, so the area under the red part of the uh, curve, that whole area would have units of meter squared, and that area is effectively going to be the mean squared displacement. So uh, in principle, you can do this. However, as you can see, the power spectral density is kind of a noisy function. So what happens in practice is that instead of trying to calculate the area from this noisy curve, one tries to fit a smooth analytical function to the measured spectrum and then take the area under the curve of the analytical expression. Now, in the appendix, I have uh, derived a relationship that uh, uses the fluctuation dissipation theorem to prove that the power spectral density uh, of a simple harmonic oscillator is given by the following analytical expression. Um, and uh, there is a constant term added, which takes care of the fact that when you measure the power spectrum, you always have a background noise floor. And so the idea is you would take your measured power spectral density and fit this analytic expression uh, to the measured spectral density. Uh, and the fitting parameters would be omega naught, the natural frequency of the oscillator, Q, uh, which is the Q factor, quality factor of the oscillator, and the constant, which would be the background noise that needs to be subtracted. Uh, once that's done, you've got a nice smooth analytical curve which fits the measured power spectrum within uh, the bandwidth or within the frequency range where the resonance peak exists. And uh, based on that area uh, under the curve, you have a number uh, which would be, which would have the units of meters squared, and that number is actually going to be equal to um, uh, the average of the uh, Q squared or mean mean squared displacement, which is the key quantity we're trying to get at. Once we have the mean squared displacement, then we can use the partition of energy theorem to determine K, the effective spring constant of the cantilever. Now remember that we have determined Q and omega naught uh, in the process of fitting the power spectral density, and we've already determined K, the spring, effective spring constant of the cantilever. Uh, so then we can determine the effective mass simply by omega naught squared divided by K, and we can determine the other effective quantities such as the magnitude of direct forcing or magnetic forcing the cantilever, F naught, by applying some of the transfer functions we derived in the last class. Uh, if we apply the transfer function for directly excited cantilevers, evaluate the amplitude of the oscillator, 
when the drive frequency equals omega naught, you can actually come up with an expression for F0, F0 is shown here, where A is the amplitude, measured amplitude, at the natural frequency when you drive it at the natural frequency. In a similar manner, you come up with the effective magnitude of base, base motion Z0 uh, using the transfer function of the acoustically excited AFM probe. These, these both expressions are actually given in the back in the appendix as well. Okay? Um, so the bottom line is that we can use a very nice self-consistent way using uh, thermal or Brownian motion driven cantilevers using power spectrum uh, to come up with a self-consistent way to uh, come up with effective quantities not only for mass and spring constant and Q factor, but also for the excitation, magnetic or base excitation, uh, that describe uh, mathematically uh, the probe dynamics in atomic force microscopy. All right, thank you very much.